So continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today we are pleased to welcome back Sherman McRae from Family Tree DNA. He will conclude his two-part lecture on why DNA. Uh, he is an experienced genealogist specializing in African American genetic genealogy and research, primarily within the Carolinas, and serves as a co-admin on the AYDNA haplogroup project. He has a special interest in the genetic and scientific advancement of Africans and the people of the dysphoria in hopes of bridging the genetic divide and discovering new haplogroups that exist in under-tested populations. He has worked, um, he has been working for Family Tree DNA, uh, the group's department acting as a liaison uh, between the researchers and the company, as well as doing national lectures on how to use DNA testing for genealogy. In addition, he assists the research and development department at Family Tree DNA with various projects within the company. He was born and raised in Thomasville, North Carolina, and attended North Carolina Central University, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science in 2006, and is a member of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, Sherman worked in education prior to joining Family Tree DNA in March of 2018. Today will be the second installment of his DNA presentation titled, Why DNA? How to Interpret and Get the Most Out of Them. He will start by giving a basic overview of why DNA testing, including a discussion on the differences between the SNP and the STR mutations, and how to calculate the genetic distance of your STR matches. The second part of the presentation will delve a bit further into the big Y testing and what it's used for. He will provide some examples of how to use big Y testing to identify your recent and distant matches on the block tree. He will also show how one of his own Y DNA lines traces back to the Central African Republic and he will end the presentation by discussing how family tree DNA is now using ancient and academic samples to further define, excuse me, further refine and identify new images and haplogroups. So I'd like to extend a warm virtual welcome to Sherman. All right, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. Um, definitely a great pleasure to be here um, to do this second part of uh, the presentation. Uh, this one will be on um, Y DNA uh, testing. Um, and this is part of DNA that's, um, you know, with the Y chromosome, it's passed down from um, male to male um, contiguously. And so um, we're going to get started. Um, so uh, name of the presentation is Your Y DNA Results and How to Interpret and Get the Most of Them. Um, so this is my direct paternal line here. Um, so this would be like my maternal grandfather his father, his father, his father, and I'm still, that's what I'm doing testing for now to try to get back a bit further and, and extend my lineages much further. And so that's what really what Y-DNA testing is used for. So it traces your direct paternal line back. Um, so Y-DNA, um, just a brief overview, only men can test. Um, since we have the Y chromosome and it's passed down and we inherit it from our father and they inherit it from their fathers and so on and so on. Men do not pass the Y chromosomes to their daughters. And of course, women don't have a Y chromosome to pass off to their uh, children. They pass down the mito, well, women pass down the mitochondrial DNA to their kids, but only the women continuously pass down the mitochondria. Y-DNA gives insight into our direct paternal and ancestral origins and into our father's genetic surname. And unlike autosomal testing, which is randomly recombined, there is no random recombination uh, with Y-DNA. So DNA consists of nucleotides, that ultimately connects in pairs and form rungs on a double helix ladder. Those rungs are called base pairs, and they're counted when measuring how much of the Y chromosome is being tested. And so you have those bases, which are called adenosine, cystosine, guanine, and tyronosine. And so they typically, you see those letters, those A, C, G, T, et cetera. Um, so those are essentially what they call the, the base pairs. And so um, ultimately with Y-DNA, we're looking at the mutations that occur. Um, and so I'll be talking a bit more about them in just a few slides. And so there's two different types of mutation. But 
DNA testing for genealogy examines the genetic mutations, which are changes in the genetic code. Those code changes form patterns that can be compared against the database. Comparisons will ultimately reveal genetic matches as well as branches on the MT and Y DNA haplotree. And those branches on those trees represent our maternal or paternal ancestry. And so ultimately, you know, we are uh, the gene our genetic um, mutations, they, th those numbers that you may see sometimes, they have to change over the course of time. Uh, you know, the DYS marker 19 eventually is going to turn to 20 or 21. Um, and so those are uh, essentially what those mutations are. So, of course, there's two types of mutations. The first one is called, uh, we call them STRs, STRs or short tandem repeats. And the second is called a single, single nucleotide polymorphism. And so um, those are typically the two types of uh, mutations that happen along the Y chromosome. And so uh, those short tandem repeats, we typically call them markers. So you have those bases, like G to A to T to C. They'll start to repeat at a specific location, and they're counted. And so ultimately, those bases will be displayed as a series of numbers. And so if you look at DYS-393, you have a number 13. And these are all markers. So you have DYS-393. You have a marker DYS-390 with the number 23 there and you know, DYS-19, and so those are, and so those are the short tandem repeats. <clears throat> and so typically when you do a STR test, that's what you're looking at is the, the numbers and we compare them against other people in a database. And that's how we can tell how closely or more distantly related you may be. So when compared against a database, they can be matched to others with exact or similar patterns. Ultimately, those patterns can reveal or confirm a genetic surname. Um, and the differences are measured in what they call the genetic distance. So I think I'll speak about this a bit more, but genetic distance is something you uh, will probably hear often when you're um, dealing with Y-DNA testing. And so genetic distance is like the number of markers that you don't match a person on. So if you have 111 markers tested, and you have a genetic distance of two, then that means you essentially matched on 109 out of the 111 markers. And from that, we can get a calculation. It's a rough estimate as to how close or distantly related you are because those markers mutate over time. And sometimes they can mutate a bit more radically, which I'll be speaking about in more in depth. And so um, if you look back at this chart right here, if you see where the uh, two stars are, um, those are, I'm gonna speak about this more in a minute, but those are like markers, for example, that have a propensity to mutate more faster than others. And so this is something you also may wanna keep in mind because sometimes you might have some markers, a set of markers that mutate pretty fast. And so it may create a genetic distance essentially meaning um, that a person might not show up as a match on a certain area because they had a certain number of markers that mutated erratically. And this is why SNP testing is so important, but we'll definitely be talking about that more in just a few minutes. And so um, with Y-DNA SNPs, um, their mutations are from one base at a single location on a chromosome. And so what you're looking at right now is, um, so I'll just read this. So if we look to the right, we see SNP BY177482. Um, that's the SNP. And so um, when we talked about the base pairs, you know, they have a genotype for T and a reference of C. And a position just shows um, where they'll be located. So um, the furthest downstream SNP is called a terminal SNP. And this can represent a family line. And so if you've ever done any type of SNP testing, um, like big Y testing or something like to that effect, you should get a SNP. Um, <clears throat> and SNP testing, so uh, the first is downstream, which is called a terminal SNP. That's essentially your most up-to-date placement on the Y DNA haplotree. 
And so basically, um, you'll be able to gauge an estimate of, uh, that's another way to gauge an estimate of how close or distantly related someone may be. You start to calculate the differences in SNPs. And so names reflect the person or the lab who discovered it. And so if you see BY17742, that stands for FT, FTDNA. That's like our signature for Big Y or the Big Y500, et cetera. We also have SNPs that might start with FT. That's, that means we also found that SNP. So different labs will typically name their SNPs, um, you know, after their lab or whoever found it, something along those lines. And so STR testing is available um, at 37 and 111 marker levels. And so we do offer the 12 marker test, but those matches and they, they are, they can be useful, but with so much data coming out, you know, you can be, you can have a 12 marker match, someone matching on 12 markers and only 12 markers or only 25 markers. And you may realize that that person is actually not even related to you because of uh, marker convergence. Um, those markers, essentially what I was saying earlier, they have to mutate. Those numbers have to change. And so, you know, if that DYS19 um, was a 19, you know, if it DYS marker 19 was a 13, it'll change to a 16, to a 21, et cetera. But ultimately, it's going to turn back to a 13 again. And so... That's why you want to test as many STR, as many markers as possible, so you can get outside of the level of what they call convergence, or because um, when you have convergence, it may, it, you know, it has someone, you might get a match and come to realize, as I was stating earlier, that they're not really related to you, and it's only a chance um, that they're actually related. So our 12 marker test is available through root projects and customer service. And so researchers often use this to qualify testers before they actually upgrade them. Maybe they want to see what haplogroup group they are or see what other uh, matches may be along those that may show up at the 12 marker level. So it is still used um, by researchers to kind of gauge if they should upgrade this match or whatnot. We um, discontinued our 67 marker test, but you can still order it through customer service. Uh, essentially, uh, so the YDNA test is now cheaper than the Y67 was in 2019. So essentially what we did, um, Family Tree DNA did a few years ago was um, they actually lowered the overall cost of, um, YD, of our YDNA testing. And so they made the Y111 a bit more affordable and that essentially made the Y67 obsolete, although you can still purchase it. It's just that it, you just get a better deal buying the Y60, buying the Y111 as opposed to Y67. And so essentially, as I was stating now, the more markers that match, uh, the more recent the common ancestor is likely to be. And mismatches, once again, are described as a genetic distance. Um, you know, as I was stating, if you take, get 111 markers tested, and someone's matching you on two to three, um, someone doesn't match you on three markers, then that creates a genetic distance of three. So STR testing gives you a predicted haplogroup. Um, and so if you do regular STR testing, uh, you know, the most common European lineage is RM269. And so you'll get that base haplogroup RM269. Um, I don't quite remember how old RM269 is, whether it's 6,000 or 10,000 years ago. I know their RM, RM269 is really, you know, their descendants were really Asian and they invaded Europe. And so right now it is the most dominant European haplogroup. And so you have to get SNP testing. And SNPs are essentially unique points of DNA that are passed down through common ancestors. And those are the other set of markers that can confirm your haplogroup and ultimately provide you with a terminal SNP. So you can't get um, a terminal SNP by doing a basic Y111 or Y37, et cetera. You can start at the lower level and then ultimately upgrade to higher levels. I, I've done that with a couple of testers. Um, in my family that I paid for, I maybe started at a Y25 at the time or Y37. I looked and see what type of matches I, I received and see if it was worth me uh, paying an upgrade because, um, 
you know, when you're looking at your matches at a certain marker level, you can see if they've done a Y111, Y67, et cetera. And so that lets you know that if you actually spend the money to upgrade, we're going to be comparing your markers against theirs. And so if they're fitting within our matching parameters, and then they may show up. But if there is too much genetic distance at those higher marker levels, then they may not show up as a Y111 match. So if you have two testers that are matching on a 37 marker level and you both are upgrade to a Y111 and, you, and you're not matching, then that lets you know that there were too many mutations that happened over the next set of markers that we examine. Exa examine sorry. Uh, we actually do store DNA uh, for up to 25 years. And so um, the viability of the DNA isn't guaranteed. DNA degrades over time, and so there are some samples that we've had 10, 15 years. Customers might have been deceased and their family members, you know, they get in contact with us and want to purchase further testing. And so there are quite a, a number of times where we are able to use really old DNA to get results. And sometimes the DNA fails and we are not able to produce any results. So it's really just hit or miss, but we've been having great success um, in more recent times using old, older DNA samples and, and being able to produce results. So the number of SCR mismatches between two testers are referred to by genetic distance, you may see GD1 or GD2. And so the genetic distance threshold at each level. So if you just took a Y DNA test, we only typically show a perfect match. Someone has to match you on 12 out of 12 markers. But if you and that person are in the same project, then we would show a genetic distance of one. So if, you know, Robert and John both took a Y DNA test and they matched on 11 out of 12 markers, but they were both in the Brown DNA project, then we would show them as a match because they are both, uh, because they fit within our parameters and they are both in the same project. So if so we do show a genetic distance of one at 12 markers if you are in the same project as that participant. And so with Y, with the Y25, we show a maximum genetic distance of two. And so that means you have to match on at least 23 out of 25 markers. And so for Y37, we will show allowable genetic distance of four. And Y67, a genetic distance of seven. And with the Y111, will show up to um, a genetic distance 10. And so this is all the indication, an indicator of how closely related a DNA match is. And, but also keep in mind, sometimes someone ha may have some markers that mutated pretty erratically. And so that created the genetic distance sometimes. And so that's where SNP testing kind of refines and hone everything back in, kind of put everything back into play and you'll be a better able to gauge how um, more distantly related you are. The tip calculator can also help estimate generations as well, but I typically use a, a different formula, like a STR formula. There was a, there was a, uh, a group administrator, his name is Ian McDonald, and he, he's a really good administrator. I think he's an astrophysicist as well, but he did some, he does some like STR calculations that I'll share with you shortly. And those are, seem to be pretty good and accurate estimates of how to gauge a genetic distance and, and how far your connection may be. So this is just um, a snapshot of my, my uncle's um, Y-DNA test. And it's just, this is just showing the matches at 111 markers. And so you see my highest match um, showing a genetic distance of one. He's someone that my mother shared about 50 centimorgans with his father on ancestry. And so we kind of connected and collaborated. And so he had already had his Y DNA tested um, on family tree DNA. And so from that specific line, I actually have three Smith lines for my maternal grandfather. So I kind of was trying to figure out which line he may descend from. And so we just took a chance and I tested my mother's brother since my mother doesn't have a Y chromosome and my Y DNA will point me to a different line. So I, I found the correct person to test who Y DNA would link us together if we were truly a match. So once my uncle's test results came back, he was a high 
really high match with me. So our genetic distance of one. So ultimately, I realized that we both descend from um, an enslaved man around Anson County, North Carolina, that was born in um, 1800. And so that's what the YDNA, you know, we, that's what the YDNA results showed. And so I used um, calculations to kind of figure out as well how far back our connection was, but um, everything was spot on with meeting this person, just a random personal ancestry. We both committed to doing YDNA testing and we actually showed up as a match. And so the second match shows a genetic distance of six and his name is James Fells. And if you can look right here, he's done a big Y. So he's done a big Y. And if you look at his haplogroup, so EM96 is actually um, an African haplogroup. It was kind of founded in East Africa a long time ago. And so, but because James had already did YD, a big Y testing or SNP testing prior to me doing it, you know, he'd already have a, a haplogroup. So I'd always just see him there as a match. And so this is what made me even want to go even further and do a big Y test on my uncle. And so I'll show the results soon. And so the other matches show a uh, genetic distance of seven, et cetera, et cetera. And my last match shows a genetic distance of nine. I'm actually trying to encourage everybody to uh, upgrade and do a big Y test so we can have a better clarification of how um, closely or distantly related we are. And so this is just our 67 marker level. And I may have a bit more matches showing up. And it just shows the genetic distance again. So if you look at the top, it shows I have 18 matches at 67 markers. Some of you will have loads of matches, especially if you have European lineages or sometimes some Jewish lineages. Um, you may have hundreds of matches right here at these marker levels. And so you just use the genetic distance to kind of gauge how far back your connection is. Um, some of these gentlemen, they just took a SNP test. So if you look at someone at the genetic distance of five, Lewis Redding, you see he has a marker ECTS 4257. He didn't do a big Y. He might have tested some SNPs. And I was testing, as, as I was explaining earlier, SNPs are just like unique points of DNA. You test positive for some, you test negative for some. And you still see James there. So James at Y111, I think he was at a genetic distance of six, six, but now it's 67 marker when we go back, you see he's at a genetic distance of three. So that means between 67 and 111 markers, we had, we had three extra mutations. And I'll just keep going back. These are, I'm at looking at matches from the 37 marker level. And I have 34 matches. So as further I go back, I'm starting to pick up more matches. So essentially, the higher marker levels you go, the less matches should show, but they're only going to show the more relevant matches. And so at 37 markers, I have 34 matches. And um, and so, uh, so I'll go back and take a look at snapshot at 25 markers. I have 59 matches. So that means we're examining. 25 markers. And so I have people like Terry Teasley. He doesn't show up at my higher marker levels, but we share 25 out of 25 markers and Peter Wolfork. And of course, we still have Nasir uh, there as well. Ben Edwards, he doesn't show up on my higher marker levels, but he's only took a Y37. And we have like Dennis Thomas. He may still show up on higher marker levels. I just can't recall. And so that's just essentially what it's showing. So we have a genetic distance of zero at 25 markers. Then we know that we match on 25 out of 25 markers. But if they're not showing up on the higher marker levels, that means those genetic distance or that mutation started to creep into play and it kind of knocked them out of our, our, our match list. And I have 25 matches at at uh, 12 markers, but these, so some of these people may not even be related to me because um, because of the marker convergence as I was talking about earlier. Uh, sometimes when those markers mutate, um, some, they, if you only examine them at, uh, at 12 markers, then because of the marker convergence actually, um, they could have show up as a match, but if you really do, once you really do testing and trace them back, you may soon realize that people showing at 12 markers, they may show up on your match list, but genetically they're not really related to you. Um, and that's called convergence. And so haplogroup assignment. Um, so it uses matches at 12 markers to predict the haplogroup. And so if you do our basic, 12, our basic YDNA test, 
we'll give you a predictor haplogroup. You'll be able to see if your RM269, EM35, et cetera, et cetera. And that can kind of give you some good clues as to uh, your lineage or where you may belong. And so we must predict it with 100% confidence. So there are some times where you may take a Y-DNA test and we're not able to predict the haplogroup just off the STR testing. If that's the case, then our company will do what they call a backbone. Backbones are SNPs. So they'll look at your Y-STRs and they'll kind of gauge which SNPs they should order for you. So let's say if you are, you know, one of the oldest African lineages at the root, like a haplogroup. So you may take a Y-DNA test and, you know, your results may come back. You get a notification, hey, your Y-DNA results are back. And you log into your account and you're like, I don't see any um, haplogroup showing. Sometimes you might not see any matches. And so the lab will run some backbone. They will order some backbone SNPs for free. And because of those SNPs, you're going to test positive or you're going to test negative. And so... If we're not able to predict your haplogroup, the lab will run, um, order some backbone SNPs, and that way we'll be able to confirm your haplogroup or your direct lineage based off of, uh, um, and it won't be predicted. So those SNPs are definitely going to confirm on which exact branch where you, where you belong. And so STRs alone don't define a line. They only show that matches share a common ancestor. STR values indicate the genetic family and the big Y SNPs pinpoint the line. And so that's pretty important. Um, and I'll share these um, screen, these slides with, some, with you if you uh, send me an email or request them, because there's some good information there that you could probably use. And so STR values indicate your genetic family and the big Y SNPs pinpoint the line. Your terminal SNP may change as other testers match and form branches, but the main haplogroup won't change. And so essentially you may be one of the, you may take a big Y test and your haplogroup may be, you know, RBY37582. And you may be sitting there for a while. And if somebody else comes along and does a big Y test and they test positive for that SNP, then you may create a new branch as well. So you have your private, I think I said that right. So sometimes you actually have a private variants, let's put it that way. Those are only SNPs that you may only have at that certain point in time. So if somebody else comes along and tests positive for that SNP, then you guys will create a new branch on a tree. Um, so that's something else important to keep in mind. Uh, because when you um, you may take a big Y test and you're just sitting there and you have like a certain number of private variants, and um, but you but and so we're able to detect and find new lineages if someone else comes along and, and and tests positive for those same private variants, then we'll be able to post that new branch on the on the on the haplo tree. So a good question is how many generations back does a certain genetic genetic distance mean? Well, of course, that all depends. As I keep, as I was mentioning a few times earlier, some markers mutate faster than others. Um, and so if you're in a group project or if you're even looking at your markers, if you look at seeing your markers in um, red or burgundy, those are the markers that have a higher propensity to mutate faster. And if those markers are mutating faster, they could they may have a, somebody that should be, theoretically should be matching you, not showing up at a certain mat on a certain marker level because they had DYS35 that started jumping around or they had DYS458 that just started mutating. That 13 might have jumped to 15, et cetera. And so um, that's just something else you want to keep in mind. So the Y chromosome results chart headings are color coded in two ways. First, each testing level, you have the YDNA12. 25, 37, 67, et cetera. And so that's what the uh, the blue colors are indicating. But just keep in mind that if you that some of your markers may mutate faster than others, and and those and these are the markers that have the higher propensity of doing so. So this is a great chart. I was speaking about Ian McDonald earlier, 
and this is a chart that I use for help me out with my STRs. And so, you know, if you're taking a YS, I know uh, some people here have already done Y-DNA testing, and um, this helps you better gauge. So I was showing you a match earlier. His name was Nasir. He was a genetic distance of one. And so we both took a Y111. So we would just go over to the Y111 section. We would kind of correlate a genetic distance of one and somebody testing you at Y111. They're matching you at a genetic distance of one at Y111. Then we know that your common ancestor could be between 30 to 150 years ago. And so this has really been a good resource for me um, to use, and I've shared it with uh, numerous researchers or people interested in um, Y-DNA. And so with my, I think another match, James Fields, he had a genetic distance of six with me at Y111. And so based off of that, it shows our common ancestor could have been 120 to 600 years ago. And so this, I'll definitely share this uh, with uh, with the class because it's something that you'll be able to use in the future to kind of better aid, better provide you a better estimate for your uh, relationship with your Y DNA uh, matches. And it's the same thing for big Y testing, but the, we actually use a, a slightly different calculation for uh, big Y SNPs, whether they're 500 whether you took a big Y500 versus a, a Y700. And I'll be speaking about that in just uh, just a few moments. So why SNP testing methods? So uh, National Geographic Genome Project, um, this closed, they did SNP testing, but it closed to the public in June 2020. At that time, you could transfer to FTDNA if you tested between June, November 12th to November uh, 2016. So you are able to test individual SNPs. So sometimes you may see someone on your match list and you just want to get one SNP tested. So sometimes you can order an individual SNP and to confirm if you're going to test positive for the same SNP that the other person has already tested for. And so that's definitely something that you could do. We also have something called SNP packs. These are bundles of related SNPs. It usually include 30 to 175 phylogenetically relevant SNPs, and they may include SNPs not yet placed on a tree. And so quite often, definitely in the past, um, researchers will order a SNP pack for, if you are RM269, they will order the RM269 SNP pack, and they may contain hundreds of SNPs there. And you test positive for some, of course, and you're going to test negative for some. And so with that, you your base haplogroup would change uh, to something different because you tested positive for that SNP in question. And so uh, with the big Y700 or other next generation sequencing testing, um, and so this essentially is an advanced test that sequences large sections of the Y chromosome to reveal known SNPs as well as private variants specific to your paternal line. And this includes STRs as well. So big Y700, they test an additional seven, up to an additional 700 STRs, and they test um, thousands and thousands of SNPs. Once again, they're unique points of DNA inherited, inherited or passed down from your common ancestor. And so this essentially makes our predicted haplogroup confirmed when we do the uh, SNP testing. So why DNA testing is the first part, um, but SNPs really are probably more advanced and they're more reliable because I keep mentioning how those STRs mutate. SNPs have, a, you know, they don't they don't mutate as erratic as um, STRs have been, and so they're actually more reliable than um, than STRs overall. And so, uh, what is the Big Y seven hundred? And so the Big Y700 is an advanced exploratory test, and it sequences millions of locations on the non-recombining portion of the Y chromosome to reveal known and private variants. And so that's the next generation sequencing that I was mentioning earlier in the earlier slide. Um, and so I'll use another example. So this is, um, so before I did a big Y on my uncle, of course, our haplogroup was just a basic EM96. So I want you to look at the second person, James Fells, and it shows his terminal SNP at BY108741. He took a big Y500. Um, and so um, 
of course, I see him as my second match with a genetic distance of six. And, you know, the STR chart says that we should be related within the last 600 years, of course. But since I did a SNP test my, my, on my uncle, his results kind of changed uh, some things up. And I'll show you that in just a second. So the time, the most recent common ancestor. So when you're, so each variant in Big Y 500 represents an average of uh, 144 years. And each variant in the Big Y 700 represents an average of 84. So we typically, you, we compare a mix. So sometimes you may have a, some testers that might've took a Big Y, you took a Big Y 700. I'm sorry, they might've took a Big Y 500 and you might take a big Y 700 and they're on your match list and y'all might share, you know, three or four private variants. And so you would just use this since uh, you to kind of um, do the comparison. So if you share uh, four private variants and one of you guys took a 500 and the other one took a seven, then we use this estimate of 100 to 125 years. And so you would just essentially just do the calculations. If you see four private variants with that tester, then you just calculate that your common ancestor would be between the last four to 500 some odd years. And so we use 84 years for SNP with two uh, big Y 700 testers. And it's the same thing is applicable uh, if you share uh, two private variants with another big Y participant, you can kind of gauge your common ancestor to be 84 times two. But if you have two uh, big Y 500 participants, you're going to look at 144 years per SNP. So, um, you know, and then you would just double. So that would be if you have two private, if you're sharing two private variants um, with a big Y500 tester, then your common ancestor could be on average, you know, 144 times two. My math is not that good, but it's like 280 something. And so um, these are the results from my uncle's uh, big Y testing. You can see now his haplogroup is EBY 100134. So with the SNP testing, I show, and with the regular STR testing, I showed you on the earlier slide, our base haplogroup is EM96. But because we did a big Y, well, I did a big Y test on him, and it tested um, loads of SNP. So our confirmed haplogroup was EBY 100134. And so that's our terminal SNP right there. And so this is our block tree. Uh, and so now you see James, James haplogroup earlier in my earlier slides was EBY108134, if I'm correct. I'm sorry, it was EBY108741, I think. But either way, when my uncle's big Y test came back, we formed a new haplogroup or a new branch on the haplo tree. And so that essentially means that James has some private variants sitting out there. And so he was all along, all along. And so when my test came back, we tested positive for some, I also tested positive for that, for that private variant. So now our phylogenetic expert was able to update this tree and add a new branch, which is EBY100134. And so we do the calculations because James has only tested a big Y500 and I did a Y700. Right now our common ancestor is like roughly 500 some odd years, but I'm quite sure I've been reaching out to him to um, no avail to try to get him to upgrade to a big Y700 because I'm pretty positive that um, if he upgrades to a Y700, our common ancestor is going to be much closer than the 560 odd years estimate that I have right now. And so essentially the same calculations. If you go up a block, it shows Matisse, me, uh, Matisse and I, we share about 15 private variants. So our common ancestor is, um, you know, roughly 12, 1300 years ago because both of us have done a Y700 and big Y700 and we're still sharing 15 private variants. And so if you look further to the left, um, I share nine private variants with uh, this person, W.T. Hardy. And so I think he also did a Y700. So you still do the calculation, 84 times nine. So our common ancestor would be at that uh, range right there. And so that's essentially how your block tree look. These are just testers um, who are at one point in time, all EM69 branches. And so uh, when you do the, 
the big Y test that kind of shows you on a block tree. And this is how you can kind of gauge based off the private variance you're sharing, how far back your connection is with the other testers. And so this is why big Y 700 or next generation sequence of testing is so much more reliable than regular uh, STR testing because you, you were able to detect new uh, private variants and kind of gauge your estimate um, based off of those numbers. And so this is just a screenshot showing, uh, so this is my SNP map. This is what they call a SNP map. Um, and so I got this from a website I use called SNP Tracker. And so essentially I just plug my base haplogroup in, I'm sorry, my terminal SNP in. And so just kind of gauges, um, you know, this is like, if you start in the middle, that's like the o over, oldest known lineages in the world. And so based off of these SNPs, they're able to show your migration path throughout the world. So if you have a European haplogroup, Jewish haplogroup, and you do SNP testing, you plug it into here, you can kind of get the same map. It'll show you how your ancestors migrated out of Africa into Europe or whatever part of the world they're from by using a SNP tracker. And so essentially we were EM96, and so that shows that was born, you know, probably found in East Africa, um, I think about 70 some thousand years ago. And so it just shows the migration path that my direct paternal ancestor took over the course of time. And so right now we're in red. That's how, so our big Y um, test put our haplogroup in modern times. And so if you look at the blue dot, EM85, it kind of shows you that was during a Mesolithic, Mesolithic period, et cetera. And, you know, those purple dots kind of shows a migration route that they took many, many, many years ago within the Paleolithic period. So the big Y test can bring your haplogroup into the modern era. And so this just shows my lineage from the last 35 to 40,000 years. So EM96, so EM75 would be a descendant of EM96. And so this shows the different branches. If you look at these shovels, I'll talk about, briefly, I'll talk about our ancient samples later, how we've been uploading ancient DNA samples found, um, um, you know, found in scientific papers. We may upload the BAM file, et cetera, and our phylogenetic expert will kind of do an analysis. So it kind of shows uh, how my lineage branched off over many thousands of years ago from EM75. Um, so it branched, there was one branch they would call EM41 that was probably born around 15,000 years ago. And so we found some younger samples, um, ancient DNA samples. So that's what those shovels represent. But my lineage is actually over here to the far right. Um, so I'm actually on the sec on the, the one, the lineage descending to the right where you see EM98. And, and we see these are mutations or SNPs. So you have EM54 and uh, ECTS694. And so this um, graph just shows a representation or how my EM96 lineage kind of um, migrated and uh, mutated. I'll use that word. So that that American arrow you see down to the bottom right, that's actually my lineage. I really couldn't uh, get that into the screenshot um, because uh, <clears throat> it was so big. And so that, the, the graph on the right just kind of shows uh, when the SNP might have been found. And so ECTS over here to the right might have been about five, founded five, six thousand years ago. And then that and then that SNP or that person had a descendant, and that would be E B Y six seven two six six, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is another representation of how your uh SNPs mutated and uh your lineage has changed. And so this is just another picture. This is a more recent snapshot of my lineage within the, from the last 4,000 years. So my lineage in, is highlighted in, is, is in that circle right there I kind of put on the map. And you can see EBY108741. If you look to the far right, it kind of shows you uh, where it says 1,000 years before present, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are the different branches. So ECTS was a person and uh, you know one of their descendants was EBY62, seven six six and they had a child and you know so on and so off so these and so um 
this is what all that represents, my lineage and the different branches stemming from our common ancestors. So essentially, you see all these um, countries at the bottom, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, I think the, those are academic samples right there. Um, and so we're all related. So everybody that has a, a flag on here, we all are related. We all descend from a common ancestor or a man that lived 4,000 years ago. And they call that SNP ECTS. I can barely read that. So I apologize about that. So my lineage just goes straight down from this and kind of branches off a little bit. So this was a really cool um, way of viewing how you're, um, how uh, you're connected to your more distant matches as well. And this is something even uh, refines it a bit more. So now we're looking at EBY, SNP. And so um, if you look at the bottom, uh, you see my American flag and you see someone from the Central African Republic. And this just further give, um, shows me that my closest matches, um, my closest SNP matches who have also done a big wide testing, they also trace back to the Central African Republic. And so with African lineages, they're um, much more under tested. So if you are come from a European line, Jewish line, they they you know they've done much more testing and big wide testing than um, those with African lineages. So yours may be filled up far more than um, what I'm displaying right here. And so this is just how I was able to trace back my lineage to uh, from this direct line to the Central African Republic because my other um, closest SNP matches also trace back there. And uh, so this is just a picture of the block tree. Uh, once again, I think I took this screenshot from one of my boss's presentation, but I, I showed it how we can, um, because we've been uploading uh, academic samples and ancient samples. I used the screenshot to ultimately just show how uh, if you come from some of those lineages, you may be able to find um, that you descend from some Vikings and things of that nature. So we uploaded a lot of samples uh, from like, there was a paper published uh, that I'll speak about um, in just a moment. And they uploaded some, um, they tested some Viking DNA samples and we analyzed them and we placed them on our tree. And so um, I'll just show, I'll get to that in just a moment. But once again, um, it's all about the number of SNPs and not generations. So if you if you look at the first block to the far left, you see you have three, you're sharing three private variants with somebody. You guys both took a big Y test and it would be, you know, 84 times three. And that would be your common ancestor. So you just kind of do the calculation 84 times three. And so you'll be able to figure out your common ancestor and so on and so on. And so that's how you actually calculate your genetic distance to these, um, these different branches right here. When you're looking at the private, the number of private variants that you uh, share or have with them. And so with academic studies, in order to make big y, our big wide database more comprehensive and interesting for customers of all different backgrounds, we added almost 5,000 Y chromosome from present day males that have participated in academic NGS studies. So this includes the 1000 Genomes Project, the Human Genome Diversity Project, the Simmons Genome Diversity Project, and about 75 other studies. And so this has resulted in a big boost in branch refinement for many parts of the haplotree with, that has fewer customers. And so this was really a big deal when they actually started uploading this, uh, I think it was last year. Uh, people were now able to go back even further and see that they were related to, you know, as I would mention, some Vikings and what have you. And so with ancient DNA, in recent years, ancient DNA has come up as a great source of information about the history of mankind. So with hundreds of studies being pu published genetic data from archaeological remains from all over the world. So Michael Sager, he's the one I call him our phytogenetic expert. So he runs the haplo tree. So he upstakes the tree. And he's the only one that works on the tree. So he analyzes the data. So Michael Sager also found the time between keeping the haplo tree up to date with new customer and academic results to incorporate thousands of low to high coverage Y chromosome results from ancient remains from, from over a hundred different studies. This has resulted in many interesting connections between the past and the present that we look forward to sharing uh, with, with, with 
users or testers. So we're still working on a way. So some uh, researchers are able to tell sometimes that they matching that they're matching the academic samples, but quite often we'd have someone email us because we actually hadn't made this totally public yet. We're still refining it a bit more uh, before we actually before you actually test and you'll be able to see, well, hey, I matched this ancient sample from certain part of the world, et cetera. So, um, but you're some, sometimes you are able to see uh, this on a big block tree, but most uh, customers may email us and, and they may say something along the lines, like I see someone here that doesn't have a flag at this certain SNP, it's just uh, academic study, et cetera. So we'll look it up and see if they are quite indeed um, sharing, uh, matching uh, someone with ancient DNA or someone from academic study, et cetera. And so this is a blog from Roberta Estes. Um, she's a, a genealogist. And so um, she's also does some work with our company as a contractor. So she has a blog called DNA Explain, DNA the letter X, P L A I N E D. So it's a really good blog. So last year she uh, posted a blog about the 442 ancient Viking skeletons, how they hold DNA surprises. So she wrote an article, Does Your Why or Mitochondrial DNA Match? And so I'll read a little bit of the article. Of course, they're speaking about yesterday in the journal Nature. Um, they wrote an article, Population Genomics of the Viking World. Um, and so, um, so essentially, they, they scanned 442 uh, skeletons from outside. So 442 skeletons from outside of Scandinavia were sequenced um, in a lab, producing whole genome sequences for vo both men and women. So they actually scanned the DNA from both men and women from sites in Scotland, Ukraine, Poland, Russia, the Baltic, Iceland, Greenland, and elsewhere in continental Europe. Then they compared it to known Viking samples from Scandinavia. And so um, this is why I chose to use a screenshot from my boss's uh, test because it showed her being related to a Viking. And so um, essentially uh, this is their, what I have circled is um, their common ancestor RS9742, that's a, a Viking sample. And so essentially she connects back, their common ancestor is probably 2,700 or 3,000 years ago. And so, that's the uh, VK324. That's kind of like the the name they gave it, and so um, and so that's exactly what it shows. So you have um, someone who did a big wide test, and of course we uploaded those ancient um, DNA data into our database, and it was analyzed. And so we were able to go back and see how far back the person she connects to um, someone from one of those papers that we uploaded. So this is really nice and something that we were still refining them to um, actually go live with. So we're still making some um, refinements to this, but this is really cool to kind of see how you're related to um, ancient um, Viking or ancient DNA sample from a scientific paper, et cetera. And so these are just, um, the, you know, so it essentially says the common ancestors are FGC 8563, but mainly their common ancestor lived about between 2,700 and 3,000 years ago. What what does all this mean? Having a genetic surname can give a starting point for records research. Why DNA testing may provide an adoptee with their genetic surname. You may combine why DNA testing with autosomal testing to confirm paternal relatives. Advanced why DNA testing can differentiate between family lines. I'll just go over some common concerns about why matches. Uh, quite often, people will say, I don't see any surname matches. Um, well, well, you, it could be a couple different reasons why you don't see any surname matches. Uh, one of the top ones could be like um, a non-parental event where essentially it could be your, your, your last name is Grant, your father's last name is Grant, for example and you take a Y DNA test and you don't see any grant matches. Um, you might see some Clark matches, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this could be an indication that this is not, that Clark is not your true genetic surname. Um, it could be an MPE event where your third or fourth great grandmother or someone down the line um, could have had um, a relationship with a, 
a grant or the name. Um, so they could have had an extramarital affair many, many years ago. And so your wife, even though you carried a certain surname, your genetic signature matches you up with a different line. So that's one option. But also, if you go back into like old world Europe, you know, where they had these different clans and what have you, um, people change names over the course of time. And so that could be another clue, like you had a name change at some point in time. Um, what are some other reasons why? Um, yeah, just name changes like Johnson. I think they call it patronymic. Like Johnson, at some point in time, really meant could have meant like the son of John. So that maybe that's why they chose that surname, for example. And so those are just some basic reasons why you may not see any surname matches. But it's really all about your genetic signature. And that's what ties you back um, to your family or your lineage. And so other concerns, I don't see my supposed surname in my matches, and that just kind of goes to what I was talking about briefly, um, is that there could have been a name change or, um, you know, an MP, MPE event um, that happened many years ago, uh, where, uh, you know, your, where you had a different third or fourth great grandfather, or it could be further back than you thought. And so that's what YDNA is maybe telling you, something that you might have not have picked up during regular genealogy research or paper trails kind of leading you back because that's the only thing you have is your paper trail that's tying you back to that certain lineage. So quite often people are surprised when they take a YDNA test and they come up with a different surname and they're like, hey, it's not matching my paper trail. And we just kind of let them know, it's, you know, you're, we're looking at you, we're examining your genetic signature, your genetic markers and those mutations. And so the fact that you have those, those matches at Y67, Y111, Y37, and they have that certain genetic distance, we're able to ultimately gauge, well, okay, well, certain, you're, you're related to these matches, you know, y'all shared a common ancestor 200 years ago or 400 years ago. And so that's where the genetic data actually sometimes trump, trumps the uh, paperwork quite often. Um, so um, other times, you know, you may not have matches at the highest level tested. I was speaking about this earlier, and that's because of the genetic distance. You might have just had some mutations that happened over the course of time. Um, and sometimes you could have had some markers that mutated pretty fast, but in most cases, it's because of, um, it's just, just the genetic distance. People, two gentlemen might match at Y67 and they, they're not matching at Y111. And that's because uh, there was too many differences between the next set of markers we examined and it put them out of the matching threshold. And sometimes, you know, somebody may have lot, loads of matches but they can't find a connection. And this happens quite often. Uh, where people come from, I see it quite often where people come from um, the different clans in Europe and they just branched off. And uh, it can be really hard sometimes to, to gain your foothold because you may come back with having um, some really good matches, but none of them share the same surname. And so that does uh, happen quite often. And other times you may not have any matches at all. That's because if you come, especially if you have an African haplogroup group or, or um, you just come from um, an under-tested lineage, somebody has to be the first person to, to test to get into the database. So I even see European lineages, uh, people who are RM269, and this is the most dominant haplogroup group in Europe, and they may not have no matches. And it's just, just the fact that they might have been the first person from that direct line to test. And so those are just things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing Y-DNA testing, um, is that the markers mutate and it just created genetic distance, but you may just get a surprise and realize you, you know, you may not just have any matches. You might just be the first person. In that case, I typically try to use autosomal testing to try to reach out to a match. So I use autosomal tests to try to reach out to a match or recruit somebody that may be from that specific line to try to get them to test to see if they can kind of bridge that gap. So um, matches with different surnames could be matches before surnames are chosen, unrecorded adoptions, recorded adoptions that were not yet found. As I was speaking about earlier, not the parent expected. Um, they call that an NPE event sometimes. You have the patronymic naming conventions like Johnson, son of John, etc. And quite often those clan members, they change their surnames quite often. 
some people um, name changes for survival. We find quite often that, um, especially uh, Jewish people, they had a higher frequency. They have a high frequency of uh, changing names over the course of time. And, um, and so uh, you also could have names that represented something like by by could you know you could have a by name by which could represent hill or river and it could be a professional or like someone could have changed their say surname to represent their profession they might have been a miller or archer etc and so that archer or that miller surname has been continuously passed down but you could take wild dna test and you see you're you're matching some mccullough's you come, and that's when you realize you actually may come from the McCullough clan or something along those lines, even though your surname is Miller. So uh, how do you get from test results to solutions? Uh, we have roughly, Family Tree DNA have roughly, I don't know, over 6,000 group projects. And so it's a great, it's a great um, thing to join a group project because sometimes they are ran by some of the greatest researchers in the world and this is like what they do. They might quite often recruit testers and pay for the testing people to test because they see that this person why DNA markers might fill in um, some gaps and answer some questions. So joining a group project and allowing that administrator to analyze your results can offer you can answer a lot of questions and they may be able to offer you some great feedback. A group project is led by volunteer administrators who usually are looking to further their own research. They're hosted um, either by a testing company, a family organization, or both. They're free to join, though some projects have prerequisites to join the scope. So, you know, an administrator, if you have a, if you just have an autosomal DNA test, you know, they may not allow you in the project because the project is focused on Y-DNA testing. They may require you to take a Y-DNA test. Sometimes if you're, uh, even though you might have the Barkley surname, for example, your Y-DNA test comes back and your surname is Matheson. Um, and so because your surname isn't matching the project's aim, um, I'm sorry, because your markers are not matching the project aim, they may not want you to be in a project as well because technically you descend from a, another a lineage, one in which they're not focused on. So there are sometimes some prerequisites uh, because of the scope of the projects. But ultimately allow administrators to analyze your DNA results. So group projects are definitely a good thing to join and, and pretty beneficial um, for people who are uh, doing Y-DNA, MT-DNA testing, et cetera. But definitely for Y DNA testing, uh, it's a great benefit. Um, reasons to join a group project: you are able to share your research, both genetic and paper. You can compare data by simply matching. You can see matches beyond your thresholds, and you can see what uh, the aggregated data reveals. And you can also learn more about the science behind the test, and you can get test recommendations from admins. You could also recruit other testers, and that's something that they quite often do, is that they actually recruit other testers um, to um, other people to test to kind of fill in some gaps. And so quite often a researcher may want to get access to a person's test results uh, so they could look at their matches and they could see like, hey, if we upgrade this person at a Y25 level to a Y30 or at a Y37 and get them a big Y, they're going to break this block up. They're going to fill in some gaps, essentially. So, um, and so types of DNA projects, you have surname projects. They can help explain the evolution of a surname. They can reveal gen geographic origins. Haplogroup projects help show evolution of a haplogroup from uh, earliest to most recent branches. Uh, geographical projects help show diversity or lack of diversity in a region, small or large. And you may have dual geographical projects. They may use both Y and MT DNA testing. So important visibility choice um, essentially allows your group a group administrator to publish your pseudonym pseudonym I can't get that word right DNA results and share your ancestor information so you opt into sharing 
Um, essentially, uh, what the group administrators want to do is they want to look at your Y-DNA markers, that Y-37, Y-111 test you took. They want to look at that so they can examine it to other people within the group project, and they can group you alongside people that have a similar genetic pattern. You guys are probably related at certain different points in time. Uh, your project profile may include any of the following, surname, haplogroups, earliest known ancestor, ancestral locations, and your DNA results. The group administrators decide which of those items is included in the project profiles. And so project profiles are always uh, shared between uh, project members. And so you have your, once you have your results, you're in a project like what's next? Uh, you essentially want to start off by writing your matches so you can compare family trees, you can build out family trees for matches. And you could also, it's a great way to network where you can maybe research a paper trail, of course, re recruit other testers and upgrade existing testers. And so um, that's the end of this presentation. I am available to take a few questions. I really appreciate you guys for uh, sticking around and, uh, and checking my presentation out. Wow, that was a lot of information, Sherman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, well, okay. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, first one, Pam wants to know, can we contact Sherman by email to ask about our personal situation with wide DNA testing? Yes, feel free um, to definitely um, send me an email. Um, you can send it at the group. Well, you, here it is right there, shermanm at genebygene.com. Or you can send it at groups at ftdna.com. But yes, definitely, I encourage that. Feel free to send me an email um, because uh, I'll be able to assist you uh, further. And sometimes I'm not an expert at this at YDNA, uh, so some, I'm still learning myself. So sometimes I may need to reach out to someone else, um, like our Hapo Tree manager, to get some of your questions answered because this is something that uh, it takes a while to learn and get in grasp. So definitely feel free to contact me. Or, or contact uh, our department at groups at ftdna.com and we'll assist you. Okay, thank you. Connie wants, uh, she says, she, um, she says, if I have a Y DNA test on family tree DNA, can they use the same existing test to do in an autosomal or do we have to do another test? Oh, that's correct. So that's what we, that's why we store your DNA. Um, and so, yes, you can, um, so just order it from the same kit number. So you you know you, your kit number is one three seven eight six. Log back into that account and uh, order that order it from the same kit. That way the lab will pull your existing sample, and that will prevent you from getting another another kit number created and us charging you for shipping. So yeah, do it from the existing account. Perfect. Okay. And then another question is: Are there any family tree DNA MT tests? that go back to the Viking or that era? Yeah, they actually, uh, so yeah, that's correct. So they actually tested um, some, um, and so that's when they realized that women were actually Vikings too. So yeah, they, they actually sequenced um, some genomes from the females as well. And uh, so yeah, they, they published those haplogroups as well. But I don't know if they put the ancient DNA samples from the women on the tree just yet. But you can contact us and we can look at that. I know they did it for Y DNA, but MT DNA, they actually give you the the, the um, haplogroup for the women, um, like in that paper, for example, that I was talking about that Roberta wrote on her blog. So, yeah, they definitely sequenced the the genome. So if you find out that you have, uh, you know, the same haplogroup, um, mitochondrial haplogroup, then yeah, that would be an indication. So I would kind of say yes to your question. Wonderful. Okay. And then um, there's some inquiries about, um, of course, pricing. Uh, everybody would like to know, um, especially when you're upgrading from one Y test up to another, how do you get on the, um, the email list to be sent automatic sale prices? Can you hear me? Um, in order to, if you, so that's like the main thing. I think you may be able to go to our website um, to get put on a list, but definitely feel free to email me that question because that's something that I may need to check back on and, and confirm for you. Okay, great. And then um, one, one of the, I wrote down a couple observations during your presentation while I'm waiting for more to come into the chat box. Yes. Um, 
one, I think one of my biggest frustrations, not only with Family Tree DNA, but with all DNA testing companies, is when you email a match, they don't often email you back. Yeah, yeah, that definitely happens. Um, and that's just like the luck of the chance sometimes that some people don't check their accounts regularly. I mean, quite often they may not check their accounts regularly. Sometimes people are deceased. Um, and so, yeah, that just happens with DNA in general. Well, when you're working with genealogy and DNA in general, uh, quite often um, researchers or people such as yourself, they may contact us or send me an email and I'll Sometimes I may contact or reach out to the person on, on like on your behalf, for example, to see if they respond. But it's really just hit or miss, um, to be honest with you, whether or not they're going to respond um, just for different reasons. Some people might just took this test just to see what their haplogroup would be or their ethnicity would be and don't really care uh, anything about it. Some people may set up a, a different email address that they don't may use a different email address that they don't check. Sometimes their uh, email address may be may start bouncing or something like it's on a gets put on a rejection list for some reason. And so, but overall, the same thing happens with me. I quite often I email, like I was speaking about one of my matches, James Fields. I've, I've contacted him on Facebook. Um, I've emailed him. Um, I've done everything I could to reach out to him, but. Um, I've, he's yet to respond, and so that's just something that I have to just have to. I guess it just comes with the territory in a sense when you're doing DNA. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree. <laughs> I think yes. we've all been there. Um, you mentioned that um, some markers change faster than others. Yes. What, make, what makes that happen? Um, it's just nature. Um, well, I don't know the exact reason. They just scientists have just pin, pinpointed um, certain markers that uh, that just change uh, more frequently than others, and they just call them the more fast mutated markers. So that's just something that they discovered over a while, uh, over a course of time. But honestly, I don't know, or I forget the like true exact reason. I know it has something to do with the like the base, the base pairs, those numbers. But that's something that I would probably have to follow back up with with you on. If somebody emailed me that question, I could ask like one of the actual scientists or people that work in a lab and kind of get back with you. So I don't know the exact answer for that, unfortunately. Okay, and then we have another question in the chat box. Uh, can you please speak to the possibility of uploading DNA to family tree DNA from other companies? Uh, for instance, an autosomal transfer? Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely accept autosomal transfer. So we tested with um, 23andMe um, and Ancestry. And I think we still take uh, uploads from MyHeritage as well. Yeah, we accept uploads. So you you pretty much just need to uh, obtain your raw data um, from that company and you would go to our site. Somewhere on the site, it should uh, say upload autosomal DNA. And from that standpoint, it allows you to upload your uh, raw data file and your account will get created. So your account will get created. You'll be assigned a kit number. It'll probably start with a B. And so we'll provide you with your matches for free. And if you want to use our tools like chromosome browser, et cetera, then you, chromosome browser, I look at the ethnicity estimate, they may, uh, you may have like a one-time $19 fee to unlock those tools. But it's all about the raw data file from your uh, testing company from Ancestry or 23andMe, et cetera. Okay, so this is a free service, so you don't have to pay? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. We, Okay. Mm -hmm. We provide you your matches for free if you want to use the tools, if you want to get an ethnicity estimate or look at the chromosome browser. Uh, they should be implementing chromosome painting soon, where you can see on the exact um, chromosome that your ethnicity is. So this will be something really useful, especially for people who may have, uh, you know, a distant Native American ancestor, and they want to look and see on which segment of the chromosome that that Native uh, na native segment exists. And so, yeah, you'll be, so they're going to implement um, chromosome paying soon. I think they're still working on that. So the answer is yes. You get your matches for free. You just pay a one-time $19 unlock free to use the extra tools that come along with that. Okay, now speaking of extra tools, you mentioned the tip calculator, but I don't think, I don't, I don't recall you demoing that. Can, do you mind demoing the tip calculator? Um, it's actually, I don't really use the tip calculator. That's why I didn't demo it. It's kind of, I think it's, um, 
I think is outdated. That's why I use the actual chart um, that I that I was looking at that that because that's probably was created within the last two years. So I don't. That's why I didn't really use the tip calculator. I should have took that out. I actually meant to take it out of the presentation. That kind of got by me right there. So some people can uh, use that. Um, but I don't recommend it. I actually think um, using those calculations are far more accurate um, where I was showing um, the genetic distance, the STRs, et cetera. That's far more accurate than a tip calculator. The tip calculator is still there and some people use it, but it's based off of some older data that's maybe more than 10 years old. Okay. So um, that's why I, I instead of um, encouraging customers, especially when I'm talking to them, instead of um, encouraging them to use the uh, tip calculator, I'll just send them out that uh, that slide um, with the ST that shows the STRs because that's far more recent and way more accurate to uh, depict your, um, your uh, connection to your STR matches. Yes. So, yes. Okay, good advice, okay. Uh, and then another question just came into the chat box. What is the website to upload our Ancestry or 23andMe raw data into your website? Would it just be familytreedna.com or what would it be? Yeah, it's still familytreedna.com. If you don't have an account, um, it would be familytreedna.com. Wonderful. Okay, excellent. And somebody just put that into the chat box as well. No uh, let's see here. Now, you, you mentioned uh, the block tree on the Y-DNA uh, test results. I actually have, um, I actually am the administrator for several of my Y uh, relatives. Uh, who were not really interested in genealogy, so they just kind of did the test for me. Um, but I don't recall ever seeing the block tree. Do you mind opening, um, uh, you know, the the website and showing us how to navigate to the block tree? Yeah, you have to have a big watch seven hundred. Oh, that's probably why. Yeah, because yeah. I, I don't think I think mine stopped at one eleven. I think it did. Okay. Yeah, so the block tree is only exist is only there for uh, Y seven hundred testers because they're they're basing that off of SNP results and not STRs. Understood. Yes, I remember your, your slide that, that talked about that. Thank you. Okay, and then um, you mentioned uh, the Viking DNA. Um, you said that that's still being refined. When do you expect that approximately to be finished being refined? Well, they're still uploading samples, and um, but they just yet to go live yet um, where like anyone will be able to like where they will have like a, let's say a skull um, showing that on a block tree that this is an ancient sample. So they're still working on that and they hadn't really given us an ETA as of yet, but they, they and so some researchers or some people that have taken a big Y test, they're able to, you know, um, see that they may be matching an ancient sample, but most people just have, a lot of people just have to email us or ask us a question like, who is this person? I see this you know, person on this block right here, there's no information related to them. And is this an ancient sample? And so they're still, they hadn't given us an ETA yet, to be honest with you, but they, it is on a block. They have, they do have those, um, that data or those samples on the tree. It's just not, you know, just kind of easily defined or where you just easily be able to see that. So that's something that I could actually follow back up with you on and kind of see if I can get a better estimate of when they actually plan to just let everyone know that they're matching, when they're matching the ancient sample and how to do it. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, uh, let me see. I'm looking in the chat box. Um, do we have, let's see here. I think we got all the questions. Is there any question, if you, if you don't mind all the, everybody who's out there who's logged in, if you can go through the chat box real quick to make sure I did not see your question. I'm going through the chat box again, just to make sure I didn't miss anyone's questions. Um, but please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask a question directly to Sherman. If you'd like, just leave your camera off. Hi, this is Todd Walbridge. Um... I think there might be an error in the beginning of your presentation here where you're talking about uh, the uh, base pairs. In the okay. DNA. I think it should be thymine. Yeah, that's correct. I, I realized that too. And I just had okay. to keep going. <laughs> I realized that that's what I was like. Oh, I mistyped this. So you are correct about okay, that, sir. No problem. I just to point that out to you. Uh, you're correct. I realized that like, oh man, I um, this is the wrong word. So I just act like it wasn't there and kept going. So I see you uh, caught on to that. 
<laughs> My class is great. <laughs> okay, uh, anybody else? Give it a few seconds here. Okay, and before, um, just to let everyone know, um, we're still recording. Um, we do go on for class for another hour or so, uh, working on our trees. So everyone is more than welcome to stay if you'd like. Um, but before you start to log out, I wanna let everyone know that our guest speaker has generously donated two DNA kits. And Chairman, would that be an autosomal test? Is this gonna be family finder? What kind of a test are they? Yes, typically a family finder, but um, yeah, typically a family finder test um, is what I'll be uh, donating. Otherwise, I could possibly, excuse me, I could possibly have to get a confirmation on it. I could credit, get like get, maybe give you a credit or something towards a Y DNA test. It's possible that I could do that. I don't think it'll be too much of an issue if I, because the family finder costs a certain amount of money. So if I actually just gave you guys a uh, credit towards YDNA, I can definitely probably do that as well. How about if I pick the names? Um, I want everyone who's interested in this uh, giveaway from our guest speaker uh, to please send me an email. Do not put it in the chat because I sometimes I forget to download the chat box. So I don't want to do that. Um, if you could please send me an email and just put into the subject heading of the email, a DNA contest, and um, I will, at the end of the day, I will, whoever uh, logged in and sent me an email, um, I will print out the names and uh, have a third person here in the library uh, use a, a bucket and go in with, you know, eyes covered and, and pick two names um, and whoever wins the test. And then um, I will send that information uh, to the guest speaker and he will reach out to you directly and determine whether it will be a uh, a Y discount or, or whether it'll be a family tree maker. Does that sound good, Sherman? Yeah, just let me know. If you guys just want a uh, a, a full uh, autosomal test, I can give you that. Otherwise, YDNA will probably is more expensive. So I can probably give you the credit for the cost of a family finder and add it towards um, a YDNA purchase. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so, um, oh, hold on. I think I got a couple more messages here in the chat box. Let me just scroll down here. Hold on. Uh, let's see here. No, everyone's just saying thank you. Okay, oh, thank so, you for well, having Sherman, me. Sherman, I, I guess that's all the questions. And this was a wonderful two-part series lecture. And I really appreciate you taking the time.